Thank you, and welcome to the Army Heritage and Education Center and the Strategic Land Power Conference. We're thrilled to have all of you here, especially as uh, the next to last panel on the last day of the conference. We're thrilled to have uh, people here. Uh, the three presenters I'll introduce in a moment take three different views of this panel's theme, which is institutional change in the Army since 9-11. I want to leave them as much time as possible for their papers, but I want to introduce all of them before we start and uh, give you their bios. We'll then take questions after all of the, uh, the papers are finished. Our first presentation is This Will Defend, Why America Needs the Army to Protect Its National Interest in a Complex World. Michael W. Johnson is a senior defense research analyst with RAND Corporation. While at RAND, he's worked on four major studies, and they include options for aligning the Army Service Component Commands, that was for uh, Army G357, Analytical, analytical support for preparing the Army budget for Army G8. Analytical support for the 2013 quadri Quadrennial Defense Review for G35SS. And future force sufficiency and risk analysis for TRADOC Arctic. Mr. Johnson is a retired Army strategic plans and policy officer with expertise in military strategy, risk assessment, joint campaign planning, combat operations, military transformation, doctrine, and force development. He served for eight years in the Pentagon on the Joint and Army staffs. His key assignments included special assistance to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Joint Staff G5 Strategy Division, speech, speech writer for the Army Vice Chief of Staff. The, uh, he also worked in the Army G357 Army Transformation Office and as an operational planner at, birth, at both First Corps and U.S. Third Army. Mr. Johnson holds a Bachelor of Science in European Foreign Area Studies from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point a Master of Arts in International Policy Studies from Monterey Institute for International Studies, a Master of Military Art and Science and Strategy from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, a Master of Military Art and Science in Theater Operations from the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies, and he completed the MIT National Security Seminar 21. Our second presentation is Building Strategic Land Power, an Innovation After Action Review, 1999 to 2009. Major General David Fastabend retired from the U.S. Army in 2009 as Director of Strategy, Plans, and Policy, Army G3A57, where he served from 2007 to 2009. From 2006 to 2007, he served as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Operations, Multinational Forces Iraq, where he was instrumental in setting conditions for transition to surge operations in the spring of 2007. He was the advisor to General Petraeus on all matters involving Iraq multinational operations. As the Director of Concepts Development at TRADOC, from 2003 to 2005, he authored the Army's capstone operational concept, the Army in Joint Operations. From 2005 to 6, he served as the Deputy Director of TRADOC's Army Capability Integration Center, the ARCIC, and developed the first Army concept and capability development plan. He also commanded the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Northwest Division from 2001 to 2003. After retiring from the Army, General Fastabend served as Vice President and General Manager of Advanced Information Solutions in the Excellus Information Systems Division until retiring early, earlier this year. He's currently an independent consultant and presents on a wide range of defense and security topics. General Fastabend holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, a Master's degree in Structural Dynamics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a Master of Military Art and Science from the Command and General Staff College. He also served as a strategic fellow with the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. Our third presentation is Institutional Strategic Planning, Why It Matters. Lieutenant Colonel Lee Pierce is a senior strategic planner in the Office of Business Transformation, Office of the Undersecretary of the Army. Prior to his current assignment, he served as a strategic advisor to the Commander, U.S. Forces Afghanistan, and International Security, Security Assistance Force, Kabul, Afghanistan. As a member of the commander's personal staff, he advised and prepared the commander for all U.S. and NATO national level engagements from March 2013 to December 2013. Lieutenant Colonel Pierce served as an infantry officer from 1994 to 2008, and his operational assignments include service in the 101st Airborne Division, the 3rd Ranger Battalion, the 75th Ranger Regiment, and the 198th Infantry Brigade. During Operation Iraqi Freedom 10 to 12, Colonel Pierce served as Deputy Chief of Plans in the 3rd Infantry Division as the headquarters prepared to assume command of northern Iraq. Once in Iraq, Colonel Pierce assumed duties as Deputy Operations Officer for the Multinational Division North and subsequently U.S. Division North 
from September 2009 through July 2010. Colonel Pierce's other assignments have included Chief of Doctrine, U.S. Army Infantry Center at Fort Benning, Chief of the Joint Doctrine Branch, Joint Force Development Directorate, J-7, and Executive Assistant to the Director, J-7, U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. He is the primary author of Joint Publication 1, Doctrine of the Armed Forces of the United States and the Infantry Platoon and Squad. Lieutenant Colonel Pierce is an Eagle Scout. As an adult scouter, I never miss the opportunity to point out just how important this is to our younger scouts coming up. So that's why I wanted to highlight that. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Military History from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and a Master of Business Administration degree from Emory University. He's also a graduate of the U.S. Army War College's Basic Strategic Arts Program and the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and MIT's Seminar 21 program. I wanted to, to read all of these detailed biographies to show you that we seem to have exactly the right people working on the issues that they're now going to discuss. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Johnson. All right, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and I congratulate you on all on your enthusiasm for strategic land power to stick it out uh, on the third day on, on a Friday. Uh, I'm going to talk about the future challenges um, facing the nation, facing the Army, um, and uh, I think these ought to inform the development of the defense strategy and also the Army plan for how the Army should adapt to meet them. Uh, but first, the baseline, the point of departure uh, from the 2013 Strategic Choices Management Review and the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review. Um, as you know, the defense strategy requires the capacity uh, to decisively defeat a regional aggressor in a multi-phase joint campaign and successfully deter aggression in a second region by denying objectives or imposing unacceptable costs. Uh, but to meet fiscal constraints, the Army is currently being sized uh, to defeat a regional power in a short conflict in which the Allies provide the majority of ground forces and uh, to provide limited security forces and enablers in a, um, in a second conflict that relies on air naval power to deny adversary objectives. Uh, this is uh, based on a number of assumptions. Uh, among them, Russia is a strategic partner that shares our goal of Europe whole and free. Um, the, uh, Drawdown in Afghanistan will continue as planned. Uh, Iraq is stable after we withdraw. Um, air and naval power is sufficient to deny adversary objectives in all contingencies outside Korea. Um, and if we get all that wrong, uh, we can grow the all-volunteer force in time uh, to uh, achieve objectives in a current conflict. And if that's not possible, then we can just deploy for the duration uh, without losing operational effectiveness. Uh, because of those uh, assumptions and fiscal constraints, uh, the defense force sizing scenarios uh, do not include uh, deterring and defeating Russian aggression against NATO, stabilizing Korea, securing WMD, shaping Chinese intervention, and achieving a successful transition in, in Korea, options to defeat ISIS beyond airstrikes and soft train advised mission, uh, or holding a state sponsor accountable for a catastrophic terrorist attack on the homeland, which the president at mo uh, multiple times has, has uh, said is the greatest threat facing the nation. So uh, in our research, uh, we stepped back and asked, uh, are these scenarios and assumptions still representative of the future threats and defense missions that we face? Uh, we think the security environment has changed profoundly since uh, sequestration and those QDR decisions were, were made. Uh, there are new and enduring challenges to U.S. interests. Among them, Russia invaded Ukraine twice, annexed Crimea, uh, presents a long-term security challenge to Europe. Uh, China presents gray zone challenges to territories that are, are administered by U.S. allies. Uh, North Korea may implode or provoke an escalatory conflict. Um, and in both cases, you'd have a potential problem with loose nukes uh, and the acquisition um, you know, by violent extremists. Uh, Iran is supporting Shia militias. ISIS is destabilizing Iraq and Syria, causing mass refugees at atrocities and terrorism. Al Qaeda is returning to Afghanistan uh, and remains determined to attack the homeland. And there's more sophisticated attacks uh, by state and non-state actors. Um, so I, I think the environment has changed profoundly and that we ought to, uh, certainly the force sizing assumptions from the 2014 QDR uh, are invalid and, and this ought to be relooked. Um, I'd pause here to say um, that I think when the Army is talking about the strategic environment, it should talk about real world challenges, okay? Typically, uh, the Army arguments, you know, in the past QDR have been either uh, the future is so uncertain that nobody knows what's going to happen, but if we're big and bad and we don't go below 450K, um, it, it'll be okay. 
or otherwise there's high risk. Um, the other variant is, is um, a collection of theory and, and history and philosophy, all of which I agree with, but it sounds to policymakers like we want to refight the Iraq war and do it better next time, and they don't want to refight Iraq wars, okay? Um, le left out in this is just how do we tie army forces to these challenges and what you see below the, the missions of the combatant commands. Uh, so what I'll do next is talk about the first three. Uh, the SECDEF has asked the Army for help in addressing uh, both Russia and China, um, and then also talk about North Korea. That's not to suggest that there's also not irregular threats that the Army has to be prepared for, and I'll come back to the full spectrum aspect of this at the end. Okay, so uh, a skeptical colleague at RAND uh, asked the good question, is, and, and that is uh, NATO enjoys a 21 GDP advantage over Russia, how could they possibly present a threat to NATO? Uh, whenever you get a question like that at RAND, uh, we're like, well, let's see. And, uh, and so we conducted 16 war games uh, for the Army, for the Air Force, for OSD, Joint Staff, and, um, and for the European commands. This is the summary of our unclassified games that was based entirely on open sources that led the way. Um, for the scenario, we looked at a short warning invasion of the Baltic states by uh, by Russia. I know there's also the Little Green Man, the measure short of war. You know, there could be a limited incursion, you know, to establish this, you know, a transit corridor to Kaliningrad, and, and then there are high-end scenarios, too. Uh, this is one that's not being addressed that I think should be. Um, there was one consistent finding across all those war games, and that is, as presently postured, NATO cannot defend the Baltic states in a short warning attack by a minimum Russian force of 22 to 27 battalions, which they can generate concurrent with their operations in Ukraine. Uh, they quickly overrun the Baltic defense forces. Uh, the effects of air power are limited by modern Russian IADs, uh, realistic sortie rates and available bases, and legacy munitions. Uh, so the idea that air power softened partners can deny objectives in this scenario is, is just demonstrably wrong. Um, and our, our, our co-war game leader, David Akmanik, uh, who you may know as a, as a principal proponent for air power, uh, concurs with this. He found the same thing in his games. He's telling UCOM, he's telling OSD that you need a core defense. Uh, otherwise, in his words, there's no hammer for the air power, or there's no anvil for the air power hammer to to be able to uh, gain effects in time. So moving tactically at five miles an hour, which is slower than th the beltway you know, traffic around Washington on Thanksgiving weekend, that's a, to say it's a conservative estimate, uh, the Russians can still isolate Riga and Talon in 36 to 60 hours. Uh, this presents a fait accompli. At this point, there are really lousy choices for the president and significant strategic consequences for the nation. They could conduct a delayed counteroffensive, basically applying the desert storm model of reversing aggression, which works against a regional power, but you try to do it against a great power with nuclear weapons, and you could have a different outcome. Uh, it's more likely that they will annex that territory and threaten nuclear escalation at a minimum to prevent the defeat of the Russian army, which at that point would constitute an existential threat to Russia. Uh, so relying on the delayed counteroffensive as a deterrent, I think, is questionable. Um, or we could effectively cede control of the Baltic states while we adopt a long-term political and economic strategy uh, using economic sanctions to impose costs. Uh, this would badly damage the credibility of U.S. extended deterrence in the NATO alliance, even if it could rejuvenate itself somehow to draw a, a new line of defense at Poland, you're left with a new Cold War. Uh, that argument could be the case. Uh, there's a theoretical option that we could threaten a nuclear first strike to try to coerce Russia to leave. I haven't found anybody yet who given the asymmetry of interests that are involved. So we think uh, NATO leaders should balance the costs and risks of improving posture uh, against the failure to deter Russia. I'll show what that looks like. So in the second round, uh, we added an, an armor division in addition to um, the force posture that we could deploy there currently, which would at best would be a brigade from the 82nd, the 173rd, Road March 2nd uh, striker to Vilnius, maybe get some British French Paris into that. Uh, by introducing an armor division, um, you can create strong points that can hold the Baltic capitals uh, for two weeks. That's the estimate of the striker regimental commander. When, when we presented this and we asked him, how long do you think you can hold? It's really limited by uh, class five and class three. Um, there's also the need for a rapid counteroffensive of another nine to 12 armor brigades. Uh, a significant portion of those must be European because those coming from the United States would arrive too late. 
uh, that's po posture. I know there's a counter argument to improving posture that says uh, we should not provoke the Russians. Um, I, I frankly think there's some strategic incoherence there. That would be like during the Cold War, uh, leaving West Germany defenseless, um, you know, but promising that we're going to risk th global thermo thermonuclear war to take it back. Okay, that's not the logic of deterrence. It's really resting on an assumption that Russia would never attack if we remain defenseless, but if we improve the position, then somehow uh, there, there's a necessity to do a preemptive war. Uh, three armor brigades in the Baltics cannot get to, you know, St. Petersburg, okay, or Moscow. I mean, they don't even have the fuel, you know, to, to get where they are right now. Um, you know, that is not an offensive threat, uh, you know, to Russian security that would cause them to go to war, you know, with Europe, or conversely, you know, if we leave a defense lift and they have motive means opportunity, then it, uh, arguably war is more likely. Uh, beyond posture, though, um, it, you can fix posture, but that's not enough, okay? You face the challenge of fighting a great power with modern A2AD and, and a precision strike system, um, you know, that, and we haven't built the army to do that, okay? We haven't built the army to fight Russia since 1991. So I think, you know, the army operating concept is a great, you know, general principles. Um, but, you know, we got to take the next step and develop nested operational concepts for how to address specific challenges, um, you know, how army forces can defeat adversaries and accomplish strategic objectives, which I take from, from your paper, the, uh, the elusive operational concept back in 2001, which is, I think, still the best definition of an operational concept. Uh, then you can start to address the capability gaps, okay? There's, there's nobody between the striker regimental commander and SACUR except the 4th ID TAC, okay? That's there for training. Um, nobody's doing deliberate planning, you know, on this, you know, with an army chain. Uh, we pay lip service to C4ISR interoperability with allies, but we've basically been able to ignore it uh, because we're either the lead in a place like Iraq, you know, or, or we haven't faced a Russian threat. But instead of the allies contributing national core and divisions, okay, you're going to have multinational divisions, multinational brigades. If you don't have C4ISR operability, you can't call for fire in support of each other. I mean, that's harder to do now than it is to call an airstrike. Um, so you need that. Uh, you got to address the armor, combined arms maneuver, theater and operational sustainment. Um, I don't know if you sort of, you know, relayed the anecdote where the commander challenged his staff to produce a head that could, you know, um, actually carry an M1 tank. And I think they might have found four. Um, you know, so you can feed a platoon at a time, you know, from the German ports, you know, a thousand miles into the Baltics. Um, Seed is a problem, okay? If the Army wants defensive counter air and uh, close air support and air interdiction, it has to pony up for joint seed, okay? Otherwise, you know, that's gonna take, you know, um, you know, an excessive amount of time before the Air Force can get into the fight. We can't fight as an air ground team in the opening phases of a Baltics conflict today. We don't have air dominance. We don't have superiority. Um, Russian CAS actually had a big impact in our games. They were able to surge aircraft and destroyed one to two armor brigades, you know, that were on the move, um, you know, through the gap there, and, uh, you know, who, whose air defense was basically nine millimeters and 50 cal. Um, they just didn't have the defensive counter air above it. Counterfire versus Russian MRL is, is, a, is a significant problem. The light infantry brigades that we could deploy there on short notice have 105 towed. Okay. They're not going to live very long, you know, if they engage. Air defense and normal counter forward is a problem. Uh, I'm going to keep, I'm going to try to go faster now to wrap this up and turn it over. Uh, the second problem is deterring China with less risk, okay? Um, there's a military, the, the Army has had very little intelligence to say about China since the Korean War. But there's an opportunity here, okay? Uh, the military technical problem is that, you know, China's A2AD capabilities are increasing their effective range that can keep carriers and short-range TAC air outside of that red ring there, the DF-21 ASM. Uh, the, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Navy uh, have proposed an offensive operational concept that would destroy Chinese C-2 radar and missile launchers on the mainland uh, in order to regain air-sea dominance inside the near seas. I think it's problematic, I don't think that the president would ever order those strikes to occur, okay? We, president Truman declined to palm China during the Korean War before they had nuclear weapons, okay? Um, there's a, but that's still the basis for justifying 
you know, the carrier battle groups and three types of advanced fighters, okay, is, is because of the concern about China. There's a defensive solution here. Okay, that would employ blue A2AD to deny China the ability to project power over water, which is a really complicated operation, if we remember D-Day, if it chooses a foreign policy based on aggression. You can do that at less cost and less risk, and the Army has a key role to play in the blue A2AD defense. Okay, there's the theater air missile defense, uh, there's operational fires, you know, there's uh, integrating a coherent ground defense by allies, and there's building partner capacity to integrate land-based anti-ship missiles and joint and combined operations. This is how the British are defending the Falklands, not with three carrier battle groups and three types of fighters. They just, a lot of air defense, anti-ship missiles make it prohibitively expensive to do an amphibious invasion. And that would provide a stable basis for deterrence. Uh, so if you look at that, the Army's operational roles you see here, um, the critical posture gaps, um, a, a, I've actually already highlighted them. Um, the land-based anti-ship missiles, I think, um, you know, has a, it, it, you could at least start from the premise of, you know, our allies are buying that, okay? You know, how are we going to tie them into USC-4 ISR? How are we going to, you know, control that fight? Do you need a, a maritime thistle, you know, where the, the maritime component command integrates the long-range anti-ship missiles like they integrate Patriot air defenses? And the ground component can take things, you know, at the horizon on in. Uh, there's, a, I think, a big opportunity here for the Army uh, to answer, you know, the, the Secretary of Defense and DepSec Def that are looking at this. This is a better way um, to frame the solution to the end of the second offset problem than a technological solution that lets us, you know, project power despite their A2AD environment. Okay, uh, the third problem uh, I talk about here would be, you know, the, the um, alternative scenarios in Korea. The story we tell ourselves for foresizing is that uh, the North Koreans will be stupid enough to launch a conventional invasion. They'll come out, uh, they'll be heavily degraded by air power, uh, they'll continue to impale themselves on a South Korean defense for a couple months. Um, it will arrive in the nick of time and then we'll all go north together and wrap things up, you know, in a bow. Um, I think more likely, you know, that, um, that we would provoke an escalatory spiral. Right, so if they do something like sinking the Chinon or artillery strikes again, uh, the South Koreans have indicated that they will retaliate. Uh, they, they won't be uh, restrained by Washington again. And then that starts an uncertain chain of events that could lead to a conflict where the South Koreans have to go north. Um, now you're in a time-sensitive situation. You have 26 million people living in the greater Seoul metropolitan area. You got the potential for, you know, the you know, 100 nuclear weapons, you know, hundreds of kilograms of, uh, of nuclear material, you know, thousands of chemical weapons, unknown biological stocks, you know, the whole infrastructure associated with that, the documentation, the scientists, you know, at risk of proliferation. Um, it, you know, that ought to drive our posture and our capability development, uh, not the traditional defense. So, um, you know, a scenario uh, has to deal with the operational challenge. That's Port Chop Hill there. Um, it's attacking a deliberate defense in depth and mountainous terrain, wire mine obstacles covered by, you know, massive artillery systems, for which we don't have an effective counterfire solution. Uh, securing and eliminating WMD and do all of that as fast as possible. Um, there's some critical capability gaps there. Uh, posture is another problem here. You know, I, you know, we. We have all of our active component armor brigades based in the United States. Are we more worried about deterring Mexico and Canada than we are Russia and responding in Korea? That's what our force posture suggests. Now, I know we got there from a number of assumptions, you know, domestic politics and budget constraints and training and institutional perspective, you know, but if, but if the Army is looking <coughs> at how to support combatant commands, you know, we just made it really hard, I think, for them to do that. All right. so. Uh, my conclusion here is that uh, we have to remain a full spectrum force. We've had historical swings of this pendulum from one area to the other, usually leaving ourselves unprepared for the next conflict. Uh, the challenges that I've outlined here, you know, span that conflict or span that spectrum. Um, and I think we still have to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, that said, um, you know, I think we need a dot mill solution to defeat Russian A2AD and uh, its sensor strike, uh, the blue A2AD to deter China, uh, the uh, Dotmo solution for WMD elimination in Korea. I know Second ID has done some innovative work on developing TTT 
P for how to be able to do that, um, you know, but the scale of the problem is bigger than the 2nd Infantry Division, okay? This needs to be integrated, you know, in campaign, you know, at the top, you know, it needs to be integrated in institutional training. We need to think about how we are going to task organize the modular force to be able to do that. Um, I think we should retain the modular force, uh, but clarify, uh, you know, core and division operations. How do we task organize modular divisions for these range of scenarios that we have? How does the division fight? Policymakers have forgotten that, okay? When we, we've started talking with, you know, OSD and congressional staffers and other people about the Russia Baltics work. You know, there is not a sophisticated under, I mean, they still have the overconfidence, you know, that with, you know, fewer soldiers in Europe than we have policemen in New York City, you know, according to general scales, you know, that we'll be able to pull, a, you know, a rabbit out of the hat there. Okay, because they don't understand anything above a BCT, you know, an enabler, and how, you know, what's the theater support structure to be able to say that and make it happen. Um, I think we should align units to COCOM contingency plans. Uh, that includes apportioning units in the United States uh, to, to COCOM plans. That opens up deliberate planning between the theater army, corn division, brigades can derive uh, wartime medals. Uh, Forcecom would be responsible for delivering that brigade that can execute its medal. And, uh, and then adapt the institutional army. Last slide, um, address the strategy resource mismatch. Uh, the programmed army is too small to deter Russia uh, by defending the Baltics if it's engaged you know, in Korea. Uh, we've recommended to Congress that they pause the drawdown at AC 490K, Guard 350, and 205 in the reserve. Uh, the, con the operational concept and capability for fighting a, a great power with A2AD and sensor strike, the key capability gaps there, interoperable C4ISR, long-range counterfire, seed, uh, air defense, and electronic warfare. Uh, address posture. Uh, readiness is a, is a problem. You know, the Army is on the ragged of edge, edge of readiness. I thought that was a good line from uh, the outgoing secretary um, and uh, organization. Now, this is the external strategic argument for the Army we need to be able to execute the defense strategy at acceptable risk. I understand internally that the Army staff has to make trades under existing budget, and I'm not you know, suggesting they're making the wrong trades. Uh, but I think until um, the Army is able to come up with a compelling strategic argument for why the United States needs the Army to defend its interests in this environment, uh, it'll continue to be challenged. <laughs> So uh, it's going to be hard to, to follow Mike because he showed you the, the sexy, forward-looking, grand strategic planning dimension of uh, being in the institutional army, and I'm going to talk about something else. Uh, as I bring my slides up, I don't know if you can give me the clicker there, Mike. Yes. Uh, I'm going to give you a, what I hope is a relatively short after-action review on how the Army attempted to innovate during what I call the, the transformation decade. And it's gonna be a comparative AAR because I'm gonna compare and contrast our experiences with uh, the Striker Brigade combat team and the, the future combat system. And this really is an AAR, I wanna emphasize that because it reflects a partial perspective like all AARs do, it's distorted in many ways from the limits of my own personal experience and my personal participation. And just like when you're on the desert floor at Fort Irwin, there's a lot of intellectual and emotional exhaustion at play and I still feel that this long after the transformation <laughs> decade. It's not comprehensive, it's not history. And I will not hesitate to use conjecture. You know, this is what I saw, it's what I heard, it's what I think, uh, with a couple caveats. You know. The institutional army is a vast, desolate, and sometimes sad terrain, and it's just hard to cover all of it. I talked to two key people to develop some of the insights in this briefing. That included uh, Lieutenant General Retired Jim Dubik, who was very involved in the striker fielding, and uh, Lieutenant Retired uh, Lieutenant General Retired Joe Yakovac, who was the assistant. He was the assault, basically and was very involved in the, the acquisition dimension of this. And I think the story of these two attempts to transform the Army is, is it's interesting because it's a, an attempt to do transformation and simultaneously fight a war. So, 
this thing go? Oh, the one on the right. That's easy when you do it right. Okay. So the reason I, I picked 99 to 2009 is, is 99 is when General Shinseki came in, and on the, the day of his, his big speech at the AUSA conference in the fall, that was the day he self-declared uh, Army transformation, and we, we set off to do the objective force and other things I'll describe. And then about 10 years later, uh, we've got General Casey, he's, he's come back from Iraq, FCS is canceled, that's the year we publish uh, a new capstone concept that, that measurably kind of walked away from some of the ideas associated with the transformation. So that's why I chose these, these endpoints. And lots of the very important things happened in this decade, you know, not to mention the wars, of course. And you could pick out, I just arbitrarily assigned five because I believe five is the natural order of things. You know, five major topics of what, what the Army did during this decade, the striker, FCS, modularity, r 4 gen concepts and doctrine, I think all of those things were significant. So I'm just going to talk about two. I'm going to talk about the Striker Brigade combat team and the FCS. And spoiler alert, I think we generally accomplish what we set out to do in one and, and not in the other. And this is not a briefing about whether or not I think the Striker Brigade or the FCS Brigade were, were good ideas. This is just about how you have an idea, you set a goal, and you try to get it done, and, and whether or not you do. So I'm going to organize this AER into five components, uh, mainly kind of categorized according to dimensions of innovation. You know, what was our ability to forecast the environment? How did we do it defining the problem? How did we align our innovation or institutional models? How did we exploit the process we had or mitigate the processes we had to deal with? And how do we leverage the human dimension? So let's talk about forecasting the environment. Uh, it's an interesting thing to have lived long enough, but not live too long. I'm in this window right now where I've gotten to the point where back in 99 and the strategic estimate from the national intelligence community came out, I, I can remember thinking, I wonder how, how much of this is all going to come to pass. But I'm not so old that I can't remember I wondered about it. So, so now I can go back and I can, I can check and see, what, well, how did we do? So if you look at the, that estimate that was published in, in 99, it's really interesting. I've highlighted in green the things that they did a really good job on. Globalization, yep, that happened. Non-state actors are going to become more important, that happened. Information technology and, and biotechnology are going to be significant, yes. Power growing in China, absolutely. Declining in Russia, probably still true. And that's probably one of the reasons the Russians act the way they do. Some things we didn't get so good. Uh, the US is going to be a more dominant, preponderant power. I don't think so. Energy availability is going to continue to be limited. OPEC's power is going to grow. Missed that by a mile. Potential collapse in China did not happen. Potential collapse in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not sure, maybe I could have colored that one amber, but I don't think it's been a total collapse. Uh, in green, by the way, U.S. economic downturn possible. That happened in a, in a big way in 2008. Some just major misses. 9-11, you're two years out, you don't see it. War in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, nope. Financial crisis 2008, yeah, you said the downturn was possible, but you didn't really understand how important it was going to be. The emergence of the U.S. as a global uh, energy exporter, not in anyone's wildest imagination. So what was the Army's estimate? The Army in 99, and you can see it in General Sinseki's speech, speeches, he said, we got to do this because we are in an extended strategic pause, so don't waste it. We talked about an operational environment for the strategic brigade uh, combat team, striker brigade combat team, excuse me, we said what we're really going to need is protected mobility and a stability environment. And that's kind of the environment we got for lots of the applications of the striker. We also said we, we need a deployment gap fill, filler because we're really influenced by our experiences in Desert Storm and Kosovo and we just can't get there. And strategic speed was a big thing. I can remember being over in the other building at the main academic building, the War College. We're here for some kind of conference. I'm in TRADOC. 
My classmate, Marty Dempsey, comes back from fighting his division in Iraq. I speak and then he speaks. And he talks about, he gets up and the first thing he says is, I don't understand why we're so hung up on speed. I'm not interested in speed, I want power. And that is one of the biggest ah heck moments I've ever had in my military career because that's when I realized we were gonna have a big problem because of the, the experiences of the war were competing with what we thought at the time we would need in the future. And speed has not been high on our list of problems uh, since we started out on these two programs. For the FCS, again, it was all about speed of response, and that has not been apparently our biggest problem, at least during the, the period of the transformation decade I'm talking about here. We did talk, we really nailed the problem on the A2 AD strategy. I mean, we, we saw that exactly. I mean, I think the Chinese read our stuff. But at the time when we were trying to field FCS, it wasn't considered to be a big problem. We did a lot of work on technology trends, and these are some of the technology trends we saw, we thought we were going to get with the FCS, hybrid drives to, to drive the platform, electric hybrid, hybrid drives that would be strong enough to do it, proved to be too hard, composite armor that would be light enough and strong enough. Uh, depends on how strong strong enough should be, but in the time of the IED problems in Iraq, we wanted it to be a, ultimately as protective as an MRAP, and we told the SecDef that was never gonna happen. That was one of the reasons for the program going away. We were thinking about electromagnetic guns, not quite yet, and uh, a affordable mobile network that could give you the uh, required bandwidth, and that's still a problem. So now you look at uh, defining the problem. So if you look at uh, how we talked about the context when you start describing the problem, you can look at, uh, for the SBCT, we were talking about no more Kosovo's and we, we're going to be in a strategic pause. If you look at FCS, and let me, let me advance this one, and you also looked at deployment gaps. The infantry clearly had a problem with protection and they had a mobility gap. And the context and the problem statement went together to make a pretty good narrative for SBCT. It was a coherent story. We generated some early progress on how we fielded it. The Iraq experience with Stryker was positive. It all came together pretty well. On the Stryker program, once again, timing is everything. When we started FCS, Stryker had a year in front of it. So when we came out with FCS, everyone says, well, wait a minute, you're doing Stryker. How many armies do you need anyway? It was something General Shinseki was worried about, and it, it did happen. And in that intervening, as, as FCS started to, to get underway, and we were defining the requirements, 9-11 happened. So now we're at war, and people are asking us, do you really want to do this while you're at war? So the problem definition got to be very difficult. And I already talked about, as we were looking at FCS, people didn't really see the need for the speed problem. A lot of the logic of FCS was built around air mechanization and there wasn't a widespread appreciation outside of TRADOC, frankly, on why air mechanization might be useful in the future. And the future force uh, either did not recognize or did not accept or did not want to talk, talk about, I'm, I'm talking about the heavy force, the heavy community didn't really want to talk about their problem which is and was that for the foreseeable future, for all practical purposes, kinetic energy beats passive armor. And there's a lot of science behind that, but we never used that in our narrative. So uh, we, had a, we had a tough time with the narrative. It was a confusing story. It kept evolving a lot on the FCS side, and it was, it was really at odds with what we were experiencing at the same time in Iraq with respect to protection. On goal setting, uh, goal setting was, was pretty clear on, on both sides, but the deployability goals for Stryker were, were technically feasible. The goals for FCS kept changing, and that gave us marketing problems. 
the marketing for the, for Stryker was very measured. Uh, you might remember that General Sinseki was very careful to say, you know, this, this initially is an IBCT, an interim brigade combat team, because he wanted to communicate that this is not the final solution. And so we did not overmarket, in my opinion, uh, Stryker. We got way out of control on FCS. It, it was it was hubris. We had the quality of first, and we said we're going to see first, understand, act first. It was horrible. Very simple bumper sticker, undefendable, and uh, and a, a huge mistake. So let me not get into a rant on that, and I'll keep going. So alignment of the innovation model. I really like. Bob Coker's model that institutional innovation needs a trinity. You need a visionary or a champion, you need a competent PM, and you need an informed inventor. So Shinseki uh, was absolutely the visionary for both, for both of these efforts. And, and frankly, subsequent chiefs had no problem adopting his vision. But the subsequent chiefs also had to adopt and had to adapt to a couple of wars. And that was just absolutely fatally uh, distracting. Uh, the program management, I think, was was good in both cases. Uh, on the informed inventor, the, inf the informed inventor for, for the Stryker Brigade was CAC. CAC wrote the, the O&O and developed the requirements in a very short time. They had operational experience. They had a lot of, uh, they, there had been, it was founded on a lot of experimentation in wargaming. Uh, not well understood that the informed inventor for FCS was DARPA. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in the future, but, but DARPA really conceived and, and, and put together the vision for, the, for that program all the way up to, to 2002. And I'll try to get back to that in a minute. So dot mil PF integration. Uh, on the striker side, it was, it was, it was unit-based. On the FCS side, it was also unit-based. That's generally a good way to do it. But for the striker program, it was built on a single chassis. And on the FCS program, we tried to integrate it by interface. So we were trying to simultaneously define the, the interfaces between every item and the unit. On the striker side, we said, we're going to pick one chassis. And oh, by the way, unless we have to, we're not going to go for any new subsystems on the chassis. And that made all the difference in the, in the world. We, we went a little ambitious on the maintenance concept, and that's in yellow because we had to back up on that. But because of the decisions we made on, on how to integrate and, and design the, the Stryker program, it was so mature that even before its first deployment, we were able to give it a significant ECP with slat armor. And we have continued to ECP that, that formation several times since then, and, and it's been viable. Uh, FCS was just really a nightmare. I see that post over there about wicked problems, and we definitely designed one for ourselves on that. Uh, with respect to organization or scope, I, I talked about you know platforms only, and it was only an Army program. When you look at the, the, the scope on the FCS side, we were building platforms, we were building subsystems, we were building a network. Oh, by the way, the network was not just Army, it was a joint network, and the radio program was a DOD joint program called Jitters, which we had no control over and was out of control. So we, we just did not carefully control the scope on FCS. With respect to organization, Minimal organization should be implementation organization. Basically, the organization to implement uh, Stryker was General Dubik got a call from General Abrams. He said, how you doing? I said, he said hey, Dubik said, I think I'm doing all right. Have you got your household goods out of wherever you are? Yes, well, you're not going to follow them because you're going to Fort Lewis, and you're going to generate irreversible momentum for the Stryker Brigade within a year. Don't screw it up. And off he went, he had one deputy, and he had a, a rotating force of 89-day temporary people. For the FCS, we built, we had the Army headquarters, we had TRADOC, and then we also did the first ever LSI. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
and then we're prototyping. We were able to do unit level surrogates for FCS, but FCS, I mean for Stryker, but for FCS, the technology was so ambitious we couldn't even reduce it to, to surrogates. So I'm gonna try to speed this up a little bit on exploiting and mitigating the process. So on the requirements, this is the interesting thing that I learned by researching this project. When, when General Senseki stood up in AUSA in 99 and said, we're gonna do something called this interim brigade task force, Army staff knew nothing about it. The POM was submitted. It was not budgeted. They ran back to the Pentagon and killed 30 programs. And that's the way it worked. One year later, General Sinseki did exactly the same thing with FCS. Announced it at AUSA. We had no, no requirements yet. Had to run back, kill a lot of programs, start defining requirements. The AUSA speech for Stryker was in October, late October. In January, General Abrams had the entire, had the Army staff, or the ASALT people and the TRADOC people down there at Fort Monroe in a meeting that all participants describe as the worst meeting they've ever had in their entire life. They went through every requirement and decided what it was gonna be. And they relentlessly tried to use only available subsystems. On the strike, on the FCS side, it was much more ambitious, much more difficult Still, the best <coughs> requirements document that's ever been written. I mean, literally thousands of documents that, that were integrated, but uh, it was not effective. So on acquisition, it went very fast on the, uh, the striker side, on the FCS side, again, you know, 13,000 program requirements. The DARPA, not the Army, decided who was gonna be the LSI. Tony Tether, great man, had never run a program. And they did it with an other, what's called an OTA, an other transaction agreement, not the FAR. So midstream, they had to convert it from a, one type of acquisition vehicle to another. And this may sound like boring things, and I, I admit it is, but this is, <laughs> these are very big problems when you're trying to build something. The R&D, I talked about, we were cautious on the, the striker side. We made three exceptions. We said, okay, we'll go for new subsystems with respect to the artillery vehicle, the main gun vehicle, and the NBC vehicle. And guess what? None of them worked out. Those were the three things that didn't work because we didn't accept the, uh, uh, currently current subsystems. On FCS, 52 critical technologies at technology readiness levels between 6.2 and 6.4 is way too hard. Uh, talk about scheduling. When DARPA started the program in 98, General Senseki's predecessor had given it to DARPA because he thought if DARPA did it, DOD would give us money. So DARPA was on this program. Their target was 2020. And they said, so we're gonna build you this program. You're gonna have four vendors, four major companies, Lockheed, Boeing, not Boeing, but Lockheed, General Dynamics, other people, they're all gonna be working on this thing. In 2006, you're gonna down select to one and you'll, you'll build it by 2020. It would be an interesting historical study to go back and look at what the, what I call the airport books were at various points in history because right before General Shinseki became Chief of Staff, he read Jim Collins' Good to Great, and he was a big believer in big, hairy, audacious goals. So he took the, he took the, the DARPA estimate and said, great, we're gonna field this brigade in 2007. 2020, 2007, he wanted to impose a big, hairy, audacious goal. He wanted something that had to be funded within the POM, so he could argue that this will produce something within the period of the POM, and so we started going off for 2007. Didn't get the requirements done until 2002. And we had to estimate the cost within a couple months. 
So I'll save how we did that for a question. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about human dimension. I'll just put this slide up and I'll just tell you my, my favorite story. I'm running out of time here. The, the biggest thing I learned out of this is that the most important thing for a program, like either one of these programs, is not technical competence, it's, it's emotional competence. Because when you look at how General Dubik did it, it is really an amazing story. I mean, he had the emotional competence to be able to go to the armor conference and say, the infantry has a problem, so we're gonna take down six armor brigades. And he had the emotional intelligence to be able to open his BOQ door that night and have a retired four-star sit on the end of his bed and lecture him about how he was going to be responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the future. And then when he got to Fort Lewis, he was given an armor brigade to inactivate to solve this problem for the infantry. And they had no equipment. So he made them turn in their equipment immediately. So they had nothing more to cling to. And he took them on a conversion junket. And he told them, you are going to think like soft and fight like rangers and move like armor. And he took them to every school where they were writing the requirements and they got to talk to people and brief it. So by the time the equipment came, they were absolutely hungry for it. It was all people dynamics that really got that brigade off to, uh, to a good start. So as far as why it matters, a lot of the problems we are trying to solve in the transformation decade are still with us. If not, uh, they're even worse. And I know a lot of that's been talked about. And uh, we, we still have to figure out how to do this. It is absolutely, uh, it's absolutely difficult, but we've got some big problems we, we have to solve and we have to uh, figure out how to do it. So I'll wind it up here and pass it on to Lee. Yes, sir. So as they uh, load my slides, I want to thank you for, for letting me come up here. As, as they say, it's always a good day to get out of the Pentagon, and, and it's always nice to come back to Carlisle and, and see old friends and <clears throat> get to see Colonel Park in the audience. He was my relief on General Dunford's staff, and we still speak. So I think that uh, speaks, <laughs> speaks well to our handoff there in Afghanistan. And, uh, way back when. So uh, anyway, let me get started. As, as noted, I work in the Office of Business Transformation, and it's, it's a small, uh, small office, and, and, but we support the Undersecretary of the Army and his role as the Chief Management Officer of the Army. Uh, our mission is to develop strategy and policy, enable objective governance, champion best business practices, and facilitate solutions across the Army in order to provide ready forces in the most efficient and physically responsible way to the nation. I fully realize uh, that driving efficiencies into the big army is much like Sisyphus pushing his rock up the hill every day. Um, but however, it's a task that our organization gets after uh, each and every day that, that we go to work. Um, so too often, the army, organi army organizations struggle with developing institutional strategies and plans. The cumbersome, convoluted, and bureaucratic process of developing the army plan, or the TAP, exemplifies the army's struggle to generate a sound institutional strategy that achieves our mission to support the warfighter with long-term continuous improvement in efficiencies and effectiveness. My paper intends to illustrate why the Army needs to promote institutional strategic planning. To do this, we must first define what the institutional Army is and how the institutional strategic planning differs from large-scale operational planning. From here, we can develop key tenets for institutional strategic planning and finally discuss some ways to promote, promote it throughout the Army. While not a business, the Army performs a broad range of business functions. We have capital assets, a diverse workforce, upstream and downstream supply chains, and a yearly cash flow. In fact, it is not a hard leap to call the Army one of the largest enterprises in the world. To set the foundation, what if there was a large organization with annual revenues of over $120 billion a year? That was more concerned with the rate of expenditure than with, than with getting, within with what they were getting for their money. When resources are cut, we'll first cut some of their core products. 
had a limited understanding of their end-to-end -end cost for their major processes, had an inadequate understanding of its IT systems and their shortcomings, and finally, what if this organization avoided making hard organizational design changes? Given these six conditions, you might think this company would go bankrupt. So it's probably a good thing that the Army is a not-for-profit business. <laughs> so what is the Institutional Army? And in case you notice, we've, if, if sexy is on a y-axis, I'm going to take us all the way down to zero here at the end of this, at the end of this panel. Um, <laughs> I have an MBA, and I think that's how Branch, I had a break in service as a young captain and went to Emory and spent a lot of money on the MBA because I thought I wanted to go to Wall Street, and then 9-11 happened, came back in. So Branch sent me to the Office of Business Transformation because I have an MBA, so that's, that's okay. Sorry. So the Army has a, full, a, a huge budget. Um, if the budget is revenue, we'd be almost as big as Apple. Uh, I think that would be number seven as far as revenue. We have more students than the five largest universities combined. We have some real property. Let me give you some examples. 108,000 family units, 13.5 million acres of land, that's about the size of West Virginia, 158 worldwide installations, 144,000 buildings with a replacement cost of over $223 billion, 2,200 tracks of, of uh, railroad miles, miles of railroad tracks, 606 dams, and presence in every U.S. state and territory. Get my slide to catch up with my mouth. Okay. Uh, we produce enough energy to power Tampa, Florida. We spend billions on IT annually. We have a massive vehicle fleet, larger than UPS and FedEx combined. We insource a long list, I won't read it all, grocery, retailing, railroading, airlines, training, finance, IT, communication, museums public relations, waste disposal, insurance, religious service, corrections, you get the point. So what functions does the law say we, we should do? Obviously, we focus on our Title X responsibilities. We recruit, we organize, we supply, we equip, we train, we mobilize, we demobilize. Another way to look at this is that um, there's, through an end-to-end -end process map, we've, we've, process, we've mapped 13 end-to-end -end business processes, uh, and some examples are hire to retire, deploy to redeploy, retrograde, or D2RR. That's really what we do um, as, as an Army. Uh, budget to report. So these are all processes that, when you really think about it, are, are business processes. So how do we get better and how do we get after these issues? To answer this question, it is important to understand how institutional strategic planning differs from large-scale operational planning. The Army places a premium on leadership at the expense of management resulting in a lack of understanding of the business processes, practices, principles, and associated roles of the institutional army. Unfortunately, army culture regards management and leading as mutually exclusive. As the, old going, as the old say goes, you can't manage a platoon to take that hill. This pervasive mentality of failing to see the value of managing contributes to the army being a large, bureaucratic, and inflexible organization. Just as a clearly articulated campaign plan synchronizes large-scale military operations in combat, a proper synchronized institutional strategy is necessary to allow leaders at all levels to manage the immense statutory responsibility Title X dictates. There is a robust concept, conceptual framework for the Joint Operation Planning Process, or JOPE, that underpins joint operations, campaign plans, and their subsequent execution. Additionally, the formal application of strategic development reduces uncertainty and adequately orders complex problems to allow for more detailed planning, while JOPE plays a fundamental role in securing the nation's interest in, continu in a continuously challenging operational environment. No such formal process or doctrine is in place to design or align the strategy for the institutional side of the, side of the enterprise. Despite the lack of formal doctrine, the Army uses the TAP as an institutional planning process to meet its POM and PPB, PPBE requirements. TAP const construct consists of five desperate documents written by five separate organizations within HQDA and aims to fulfill two critical missions for the institution. First, it desires to cast a broad strategic path for all Army activities to follow over a 10-year time horizon. Second, as mentioned, it provides a method to prioritize, program, and fund Army near-term resources over the FIDA to meet its POM and PPBE requirements. 
These two admirable and necessary requirements for an Army institutional strategic plan, however, as currently constructed and implemented, TAP fails to provide a useful roadmap for institutional planning. This is largely due to its propensity to focus myopically on tactical and operational activities and resourcing near-term requirements instead of institutional activities and long-term planning. It also fails to fully apply the tenets of strategic institutional planning. What are the key tenets for institutional strategic plans? What are they that they must have? Um, let, me, let me go over five of them briefly with you. Number one, they should set clear goals and objectives. In the institutional environment, it is important to realize an enemy can take on a different form than those found on the battlefield. Inefficiencies, cost overruns, and delayed fielding of equipment are examples of the results of inadequate institutional strategies. Delivery of world-class support to the warfighter without the presence of an enemy, however, affords the opportunity to build efficiencies without the danger of those efficiencies causing harm to our soldiers. This is only possible by setting clear objectives and goals that aid in measuring performance. Clearly defining objectives to be achieved prevents misalignment between business operations and operational forces and improves the efficiency and effectiveness of business operations. Number two, cost and form that balances efficiencies and effectiveness. A common phrase heard within the walls of the Pentagon is physically constrained environment. We hear we must make the most of taxpayers' money. However, the Army must always seek to be good stewards of our resources, regardless of the physical environment. Number three, synchronizes planning across organization. An institutional strategic plan must identify the key stakeholders and method to ensure synchronization and integration. The for forcing mechanism to ensure synchronization must come from the secretary and the chief. These two individuals are the only two who can break down the barriers and in institutional inertia. Number four, must be observable and measurable while allowing flexibility for learning and adapting. You know, General O used to ask before he left, what, how much does it cost to, uh, to create a combat ready brigade? And nobody in the building could give him a definitive answer on the total cost of a combat ready brigade. We therefore must better define the true cost of activities as well as allow the uh, complete transparency to internal and external organizations. In short, the Army must have institutional strategic plans that are observable and measurable. Finally, number five, must lead to operational readiness. As the new chief said at the 2015 AUSA conference, uh, he said readiness was his number one priority and there was no other number one. A sound institutional strategic plan will always have this as the underlying criteria for everything it demands. How do we promote institutional strategic planning throughout the Army? The first is in officer PME. Our future leaders need this training in order to position them and the Army for success in running large bureaucratic organizations. Within the short period spent in school during an officer's, officer's career, little if any time is dedicated to the study of the institution or Title X functions and activities of the Army. Furthermore, there is no time devoted to institutional strategic planning. We need to modernize our officer education system to include that type, uh, the type of management training done by our corporate counterparts. Future curriculum should include some, if not all, the following, force development, force management, PPBE acquisition, and so on, uh, Lean Six Sigma, et cetera. The second way is, is uh, actually developing um, institutional strategic plans. Headquarters DA is, is currently in the process of writing an Army business strategy for which I'm the co-author. The Army business strategy seeks to apply these five tenets mentioned in the previous slide to continuously improve the Army's ability to generate readiness at best value with business processes and management practices that reduce costs and allow us to meet or exceed the quality, quantity, and timeliness of mission command requirements. Institutional strategies must balance, as I said, the efficiencies and effectiveness while driving leaders to make cost-informed decisions. It must encompass the entire organization, setting conditions for staff integration and synchronization while breaking down stovepipes. Additionally, these strategies must be observable and measurable, allowing transparency and honest performance assessment while preserving the flexibility for the organization to learn, adapt, and innovate. Finally, and most importantly, it must contribute to the Army's primary mission of having trained and ready land forces for worldwide employment. Thank you.
conference has presented a lot of perspectives on the viability and importance <coughs> of land power, how it should be used, and how best to sell it. This panel presents three different views on the institutional arguments for the part of the Army that makes land power possible. Uh, I want to frame this uh, discussion, and we'll have Q&A in just a, a minute, but I want to throw out some, some things for our panelists to think about and perhaps uh, answer. Uh, Mike, your colleague Dave Johnson from RAND made some thought-provoking comments yesterday, and I'd like to use those comments to start uh, to, to frame all of our discussion. Speaking of the post-Cold War drawdown of the mid-1990s, Dr. Johnson observed that all of the decisions made at the time were the right ones in the context of that time. And he also observed that the problems we face today are not for 20 years from now, but rather for today and tomorrow. Now, the beauty of being a historian is that we get to look back at those decisions from 20 years ago and say, you did the wrong thing. Our framing question for today, though, is how do we make the right decision today for tomorrow, and, and specifically in our institutional army, with, res with regard to the provision of land power? And with that, I'll offer some thoughts on each paper and end with a question for each of you to get us started, and then uh, maybe that'll, that'll uh, prime the pump for other questions from the audience. Mike Johnson offers a sobering and somewhat terrifying counterpoint to some of the previous presentations. Uh, I might also preface this by saying I've had the advantage of reading the full papers so I can uh, expand a little bit on what we, uh, what we saw here. Linking force sizing to a defense strategy has been used in recent years as an adequate means of balancing ends, ways, means, and risk. Mike warns, however, that recent budget balancing efforts through sequestration have created a mismatch of strategy and resources at a time when the nation can ill afford it. The Defense Department, long viewed as having bloated budgets and unnecessary redundancies, seems an easy target for a cost-conscious cost -conscious Congress in an era when wars seem to be winding down. Mike notes, however, that many of the present-day threats, such as a resurgent Russia and the new terror of ISIS, appeared after the mechanism of sequestration became operative. The Defense Department is thus forced to confront threats within resource allocations rather than developing defenses and then applying resources to them. Fortunately, this is not new territory for the Army. Within this defense context, the Army faces numerous challenges. Mike ar argues that unlike the situation of the Cold War, there is no strategic pause. The current strategy seems to focus on dropping BCTs around the world for short-term missions, but this is not an adequate to address the range of missions that the Army undertakes. He, he suggests several initiatives to address or mitigate the complex problem the Army faces as, as an institution, but warns that none of them will solve the problems created by sequestration. He also calls for using the same sizing constructs as the more technologically based, but less manpower intensive Army or Air Force and Navy. So, Mike, I have two nested questions for you that will get to the heart of what this conference is all about, and you can answer one and ignore the other, or try to combine them if you want. First, how does the Army convince Congress of the critical role of land power if we've not been able to do so already? And regardless, and perhaps more importantly, regardless of that, how do we convince our own leadership to be mindful of the cuts that we make to ourselves? General Fastabend criti critiques Army innovation for the past 20 years, citing two critical weapon systems as examples of success and failure. While the Army began future work in the mid-1990s with Force 21 and the Army after next, the effort became truly institutionalized in 1999's Army transformation. Using the Stryker and FCS as examples, General Fastabend describes the difficulty inherent in institutional innovation. In order to innovate, the institution is challenged to predict a very uncertain future. Unlike a business model that allows some degree of predictability, the Army's present and future can, can change quickly, drastically, and irrevocably. The strategic pause resulting from the end of the Cold War was believed to be the perfect time to begin the sort of institutional innovation the Army needed, but 9-11 ended that brief interlude. The Army was forced to adapt to a new present with a deterministic yet uncertain future. The pre-war environmental forecasts and problem definitions became irrelevant or at least markedly different in the context of unplanned, sustained combat in multiple theaters. 
these are the outside drivers, and you heard the descriptions of the internal problems that we also experience. General Fastaman also argues that the environment of today is similar to that of 1999. There's no strategic pause, perhaps a small reset window, but with much greater immediate danger. Institutional change, like innovation, requires clarity of thought and strategic vision. While surely no one in this room doubts that soldiers are the centers of our formations, if we fail to properly develop our institutional approach to innovation, soldiers may soon be the only thing we have in our formations. My question to General Fastabend is, what do we do now? Lieutenant Colonel Pierce makes an inter takes an enterprise level view of the institutional army. He argues that operational strategies abound, but the army lacks a true institutional strategy to guide the work of what could be considered a Fortune 20 company. Lee contends that the Army must harness its substantial operational planning capabilities and harness it toward the institutional side. Whether any of us like it or not, the efficiency, or lack thereof, of the Army's business enterprise can have effects on the overall provision of land power. In the political realm, efficiency equates to effectiveness, and inefficiency, however effective, may jeopardize the perceived efficacy of land power. Moreover, Lee has linked the, enterpri the enterprise business process to readiness. That is, the Army's ability to provide the land power to combatant commanders. Sitting here at the Army War College, I applaud your appeal to PME to address this issue. On the other hand, we've had several other presenters during this conference who made the same recommendation for solving their problems. By my rough historian-based math, our recommendations formed from the last three days have now made the captain's career course at least two years long. <laughs> I say that in jest, of course, but here is your, your nested question. Who should be doing this planning, and what role does the rest of the Army play? Where do you think is the biggest broken link in the institutional planning chain? Gentlemen, you have food for thought, so I'll let you take it from there. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I'll take the first one. You know, how, how does the Army convince Congress? Uh, the you know, the first step is just deciding that it wants to, okay? Carl Bilder wrote a really good book called The Masks of War, where culturally the Army is reluctant to make strategic arguments, you know, that, that borders on national policy about, you know, what should we be doing, what should we not do, what you know, what should we size the force um, to do. Um, and it's, it's also reluctant to make joint arguments as well. It's like it'll have its say in private, not very coherently, and then it'll just execute the mission that's been given it, and right now that's drawdown. Um, I, I think um, the, the other aspect of it is, like I said, you know, the, 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 you know, the Army's argument up to now, and it kind of gets on your second question about, you know, has been, well, the future is so uncertain, so it doesn't talk about real world threats, okay? Um, I think if you look at what I outlined, okay, there's two great powers, Russia, China, uh, you know, two regional powers, Iraq, or uh, Iran, and North Korea, uh, collection of transnational networks, you know, and cyber. That's a full range of military operations there. I think it's gonna present a lot of problems you know, over the next five to 10 years. Uh, certainly it would be a good basis for the defense program to be able to address. Uh, but even if there are some, you know, changes within that, you've still got a flexible start point so that if there is a shock, you know, um, you know, it's like Michael Howard said, you'd be able to adapt. You know, you're not so far wrong by overly specializing in one area that you can't get to the other. Um, I think the, the leadership is mindful of the cuts. I mean, they are pained by them almost to the point of paralysis. I think what's more missing, you know, is really what's the coherent logic that ties all these cuts together other than we have to pay the bill, okay? You know, you know, what's our, you know, theory for, you know, how we're going to fight? What do we need to do that? You know, what can we do? Um, and, and so that we understand, you know, for example, you know, if you're thinking that, you know, you've got to pause today, and, but future threats are on, you know, on the rise, and then there's a logic to, you know, cut end strength, hold it readiness, and, and do more with modernization. Um, if, vice versa, if you think you're going to be in a major theater war on the new chief's tenure, you hold on to structure, hold on to readiness, you know, fight with what you got, you know, or, you know, if you're not sure, then a balanced approach. But some kind of theory about, you know, the real world threats in the, in the environment and how the Army can adapt to meet it. Uh, back to Dave Johnson's uh, observation, um, you, I actually think, it, you know, the, the, 
collectively, we have passed the threshold in Europe of what would have been a prudent hedge in case Weimar Russia didn't work out as planned. Okay, um, you know, the, you know, in 1991, we just assumed that this genuine democratic, you know, transition is going to take hold. They're a strategic partner. They share our goal of Europe, Poland free, even as we're expanding NATO, you know, within 100 miles of Stalingrad and Leningrad, and they're okay with that. Okay, you know, and but still, you know, we end up at this point where, you know. Uh, OSD can't call Russia a threat because that would screw up the State Department's reset. Um, you know, so there is no forced sizing scenario for Russia. You know, so the chief says, all right, then I'll bring the armor brigades home, okay? You know, th there are bureaucratic and institutional reasons for that decision. I just don't think they're very strategic, you know? Uh, a strategic decision would have been, let's keep a hedge in case the Putin Medvedev collective there, you know, does something unexpected. So my question is, is the easy one, you know, what should we do now? The, I think the Army should be preparing for what I would describe as a uh, institutional earthquake. You know, we, the, the defense community navigates this institutional terrain and the landmarks on the terrain are things like the National Security Act of 47 and then it's refinement in 48 and DOTMA and Goldwater Nichols, and we, we tend to take these <coughs> policies and these constraints as, as, they're just like, they're immovable. They're like the mountains and rivers that guide a military maneuver. But every now and then an earthquake comes by and the terrain itself changes. Uh, I've taken it upon myself to, to watch all the SASC hearings this fall. And I think, uh, Folks outside the DOD are getting ready to, uh, to put us through an inst institutional earthquake. And the Army has two choices. It can, uh, it can brace for impact or it can try to have an impact. It can try to hold on to as much as it has or it can decide what it wants to help topple over and think about how to rebuild. It, the reason I think there's gonna be an institutional earthquake is because the st strategic environment is not the same as 99 at all. It's always changing, but, but suddenly people are beginning, are beginning to realize that it, it's fundamentally different and that the, the chance of peer or near peer competi competition or conflict is very real. And we've, we've been saying that for years, acknowledging it is different from appreciating it. And now people are beginning to appreciate it. And I think some of the work Dave Johnson has done out of East Ukraine kind of helps illustrate what that looks like. And our strategies don't seem like they're working. And technology is really significantly changing the operational environment. And I know we have guys from the acquisition community here. Man, if you were in the acquisition community and were listening to those hearings and you wanted a friend, you better get yourself a dog because and everyone is, all the witnesses would say, yeah, and that dog's gonna be expensive, it's gonna be delayed, it's gonna be obsolete dog. It, it is just rough. No one's happy uh, with how things are going in, in acquisition. So we've been through this before, and a lot of what we're gonna have to do next time, I think is, it should be the same. Ideas will, will, will drive change. Change in the institutional army will change the operational army. But when we do it this time, we've got to, you know, when we did it in the, in the doctrinal reforms of the mid, the mid 80s, and when we uh, did some modernization, right? Well, with an acquisition system that still worked at the time, the focus of the army was mostly internal and it was reactive. This time, the focus of the Army has got to be significantly more external, and it's gonna to have to be proactive. And there's three things that are most important. There's strategy, and there's concepts, and there's doctrine. The, uh, the Army has got to recover what it used to be in strategy, 
just because we haven't done it in a long time doesn't mean we can't have a Marshall or an Eisenhower. I mean, I don't think they've, they've passed a law that says we don't do strategy, although a lot of people will tell you services just do budgets, they don't do strategies. And I think we in the country have, have suffered for that. But we haven't helped ourselves because what we put out as strategy around here is a very sh shallow and insufficient theory of strategy. And there is no doctrine of strategy. We say strategy is about ends, ways, and means, and I will get out of the building tonight using ends, ways, and means. But we do that, and we confuse ourselves, and we confuse people around us. It, it makes you feel like you're thinking, but you're not posing and evaluating choices. And that is just about ruin the country. And we have got to fix that. We have got to put together the same thing we did for operational art in the mid 80s. Probably this place right here, this institution, needs to collect the theory on strategy and figure out what our doctrine of strategy should be and start teaching strategy as case studies and not this mindless linkage of ends, ways, and means. As you can tell, I'm a little passionate about this. Uh, on concepts, we've, we, we're, I think we're very concept-minded. I think our, the AOC is the best written and best promulgated concept we've ever had. But I think something is wrong because we now ignore our doctrine and we believe our concepts. We should believe our doctrine and be skeptical of our concepts. We've got it totally backwards. And the problem is we've, we've put focus on these premier concepts that are so big and so broad because the scope of conflict has expanded into new domains, information domains, cyber domains, space, and we're trying to cover everything, and you can't simultaneously explore the concept, war game it, do a simulation, and do an experiment. It, because the, your, your intellectual energy is on the conceptual level is way too broad. What I'm very excited about, what, about what Mike is doing is, He's got the right words on the slides there. He says, let's talk about operational concepts for specific military problems. And describe the operational approaches, war game them, see what the implications for capabilities are, because we have lost the linkage between concepts and capability development. And that has not helped us out. And then finally on doctrine, I think we're the victims of catastrophic success. We had a wonderful doctrine revolution in the mid 80s. We wrote a, a great capstone document and since then we've been polishing the rock. And now the rock is flat and the rock is, is fractured. It's fractured because we said, well, in the social environment, no one has the attention span to read it, so let's make it short. That's the next thing we can do for doctrine. Let's make it nice and short. So then you, you've got the summary, and then you've got the, the reference part, and no one's reading either one of them. And when you do read them, you find out what we have is a book of list, because you're just trying to, to, to catalog everything that goes on in, in the modern conflict environment. There's no exploration of the tensions between these components in the list, and there's just no understanding. And, and to, to integrate, you need strategy, you need concepts, and you need doctrine, and we've got to rediscover what we do on that. So, have at it. So, uh, I would have been disappointed if you hadn't said, well, where are we going to fit, it, uh, fit the, uh, the new PME into the uh, curriculum here? I, I spent enough time at Fort Benning and in TRADOC and to understand that there's, a, it's, there's, there's limited space, but um, in, in any curriculum to, to, put, uh, to put an additional course and certainly uh, a course on uh, on business management, or or you you name an MBA in uh, in a week, or or however you want to call it. Um, who should be doing? I think I think everyone should should be um, from the you know the lowest the lowest ranking to the highest ranking should should be concerned with uh, managing our our resources and getting effectiveness uh, out of what the government gives us. I mean, every September, what happens across the country? Every resource manager is asked what their rate of expenditure. No one ever asked them, well, did the money Congress and the taxpayers gave you this year, 
you know, have, have we made the most of that money? Uh, we, we worry about rate of expenditure. Um, one area that I didn't talk about for, for time's sake is, is, is OBT, my office, our office, helps the CIO G6 set policy on business IT systems. And uh, over the last 18 months, we've taken those systems, and it's $2.2 billion a year the Army spends on IT systems. There's, there was over 800 of them. We've, we've gotten it down to about 700, and a goal is to go down to 400 IT systems. So that's one area that an institutional strategy is where we need to start and where we're working on. But every time we go to a post, uh, you name the post, we'll go and we'll uncover a different IT system. You know, one post has two IT systems to, to track uh, ID cards coming on post. One system, you know, uh, one post has two different uh, fire alarm systems. These are all IT business systems that how they get created is, is, well, we know how they get created. The boss says, I want this, go make it happen. And, and, the, and the local, local uh, installation goes and makes it happen. So that's one area, that's real money, that's 2.8, uh, 2.2, 2.8 billion, depending on uh, how you count it. That's real money, and uh, we're getting after that on efficiencies and effectiveness. But like I said, every time we 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 think we're getting it lower, we uncover more systems. But um, I'll just stop right there. We have a couple minutes for questions from the audience. If you would please raise your hand, and uh, we'll get a microphone around here. Ah, uh, Jim Embry. Uh, I'm going to be a bit of a cynic here, not that there aren't a few sitting up there, but the uh, here's one of the things I'd, I'd like your opinions on. Um, I've heard I've heard the speaker, starting with Dan Bolger on Ford, talk about the lack of strategic guidance that's been delivered to us, the lack of support, uh, the, and we can fill in all the lacks that we have: the lack of budgetary authority, the lack of dollars, the lack of of size of force, or whatever. Let me turn that around. Maybe we've, maybe we've been given too much discretion to define our own future. Because one of the interesting things I think about history is, and John, probably you can help me out with this here I'm, I'm, if I misquote, but Starry's Boathouse Gang that then in turn looked at the strategic environment, said that the Army that we have doesn't fit. We need to build a better one conceptually, doctrinally, and then in turn, we need to be able to resource and equip that army to accomplish things that then in turn really make military sense to achieve strategic objectives. So it's not like we haven't done, uh, General Fastabend, what you were fr so frustrated at before, just under different conditions. But I'd throw out maybe the opinion that we've been given too much discretion and we've been deferred to too much in being able to shape our own future. Because one of my frustrations is, is that the Army that I see right now is going back to what its comfort zone of the 1990s, irregardless of the fact that the, the strategic environment we face right now with non-state actors, violent extremist organizations, requirements to use military forces rather than just military force to accomplish national objectives are much, much more the challenges that the force is gonna have to face in the future, and we will not be given irregardless of whether we want it or not, carte blanche authority to use force as we, as we, uh, as we desire versus the constrictions and restraints of what it is that the political leadership is, is going to uh, set for us and the international community will set for us. So the point I'm getting to more than anything else, it, it, I, I take a different spin on this. We've been all about delivering decisive force and we've forgotten how to be a decisive force in many ways. Because decisive force to me means, decisive land power means, that we can, we can fashion and utilize military forces in conjunction with the, with the national, with the other national elements of power and other agencies of government and multinational environment to accomplish the strategic ends of the United States. But yet, we're going back to the NTC, walking away from lessons that we've had in the, over the ba past decade, and trying to just simply get back to the comfort zone of the force that we want to fight the way we want. And every time I hear general officers talk about, we can't even jump the brigade talk, who the hell cares? It doesn't matter if the Army doesn't meet our strategic needs. Now again, I apologize for being cynical, a bit cynical here, but I'd just like to get your all's opinion on that, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong.
I'll lead off. <clears throat> um, you know, on the qu first question about, uh, you know, are, do we have too much discretion? Um, for me, it's almost that a lot of times, you know, the hard policy questions, even for OSD, to work within the NSS process are too hard. You know, and so in the last QDR, you had OSD doubling down on what John Tuhigs, you know, director at Anarchic does. And we had a big debate about do we need a 30,000 man advisor corps? You know, I, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, those types of, you know, dot mill development, you know, are best left to the Army, but the Army ought to be able to explain exactly how they support combat commands to deter, you know, and counter the principal challenges in accordance with defense priorities. So, so I, don't, I don't see that we have too much discretionary spending. On, on the question of balance, I agree with you that, you know, non-state actors, violent extremists, you know, are, are still a problem. I didn't mean to give the impression that they're not. Um, I think I don't think that we should walk away, you know, from those lessons. You know, though, although even in Vietnam, we didn't after that we didn't walk away as much as everybody thought we did. I mean, we preserved light infantry divisions. We we created the JRTC, you know, and you had large you had large portions of the force that were looking, you know, at those areas at the time where OSD wanted the entire army to be mechanized. Okay, if the army hadn't fought, you know, to try to preserve its discretion, you know, we would we'd have been in worse shape, you know, for Panama and, and uh, you know the 90s and even Iraq and Afghanistan than than we were. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we have is that where you have state-based threats that present high consequence, you know, scenarios to U.S. vital interests if they're not deterred. Okay, so. The department has to focus on them, has to deter them from happening. It usually succeeds. If it sets out to deter something, we usually succeed in, in doing that, which means, you know, by the security or you know, stability and stability paradox that you're going to have s something else pop up, you know, uh, and that's where I think you see a lot with the non-state actors. And so we have to be able to do that. You know, we still have more soft on the books than we had at the height of the Vietnam War, you know. Um, I, I think that, you know, we should look at, you know, unconventional warfare options, you know, to be able to do that. Um, you know, uh, and we still have the balance between light and armor. You know, we've been taking down, you know, much more armor since the end of the Cold War. You know, the balance used to be 50-50. It's not 50-50 anymore. Um, so I don't, I don't think we're in danger of being unprepared for the, for the non-state actor. Um, I think we're more danger right now in terms of, you know, there's no credible deterrence. But, but again, I think what you're describing here is the challenge, is some of the challenge we've got. If it's all about the, the, the ratios and ability to deliver force to successfully support the nation's objectives, then I don't disagree with one thing you're saying. I, I absolutely agree. Then it's a calculation. But the question is, is what do we need an army and what do we need strategic land power for to do in the future? And I would argue where we don't have a whole of government capability, we don't have sufficient integration across the agencies of government to produce holistic deployable packages that then in turn can accomplish objectives beyond just simply defeating something that maybe we just need to investigate. Is it all just about the balance of force? Yeah, no, I agree on the whole of government side. How is the Army going to fix that? You know. Let me, um, let me interject here, gentlemen. The sign of a great panel is running out of time before you run out of interest. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, very uh, information, uh, informative and insightful comments and, uh, and, and also uh, questions from, from Jim and others. If you have other questions for our panelists, we'll, we'll take a break here for, uh, what, 12 minutes, and uh, we'll be milling around outside. Thanks very much.